After ascending to the top of the list, Buddy came face to face with Dr. Yato, the man behind the mutants that are emerging across the land and is fighting for her life against his personal sweetheart. Buddy ferociously fights off the monstrosity until receiving aid from an unlikely ally. Buzzo appears and draws the ire of the monster. Having known Yato's plan and seeing the devastation of Olaith with his own eyes, he knows Buddy's curiosity of joy got the better of her despite his warning and his suffering from the side effects of joy. In a strange gesture of altruism, he reveals to Buddy that Yato has a vaccine for joy that will prevent her from mutating. He presses her to chase after him, preventing the large mutant from stopping her. Buddy runs after Yato, finding him sitting on an extravagant, fleshy throne made up of an amalgamation of joy mutants, his trumpet held in reverence by one of the monsters. Buddy begins firing off questions to Yato, who is shocked she lived the fight from his mutant. He orders her to leave before weakly threatening to kill her. Buddy mocks him for what she perceives as cowardice and demands answers from him, but when he refuses to offer any, Buddy reveals her true desire. She wants that throne. She starts to cut down Yato from his pedestal, who hesitates, struggling with what he should do. Eventually, he steals his resolve, and choosing to save his throne, begins fighting back, the tune of his trumpet sounding out before an attack from his children. At the same time, a strange feeling begins to well up within Buddy, and her head starts to hurt. She shakes off the pain, continuing her fight until it gets to be too much for her, and she begins to lose control of her mind. When she looks at Yato again, he has changed. The flesh of the topmost mutant has become rough and scarred, like it's recovered from some brutal wound inflicted in the past. The trumpet has been replaced by a white flower that now attaches to the mutant through a branch-like appendage and Yato himself has vanished, and in his place is the face of her brother, Dusty, who smiles back at her with warm sadness. Although the throne has taken the distorted vision of Dusty, Buddy's battle with the mutants is still raging, so she cuts down every single monster that made up Yato's throne until they are all destroyed. And as she completes this task, she hears Dusty's soft voice come from the remains. It causes her to lose control of her mind, and she blacks out. Someone tries to gently wake her, pumping her up for her big day. Today, she gets to go outside. As light hits her eyes, the sky above has a rosy hue, and there are white flowers around her feet, all sprouting out of a sea of blood. Compelled to explore, she follows the white flowers until coming to Brad, her father, as she saw him in his last moments as a man. But it's not the weapons that pierce him now. It's white flowers, just like the one they found during her first trip outside. When she approaches, she can't help but to pull her blade to attack him and finds that he's now a young man. He stands there, lost, not wanting to continue on, just like he was before he found her. With a smile in his voice, Brad tells her how she got her name. It's simple. She's his little buddy. He always called her that when she was a baby, and it, it just stuck. Brad and Buddy. He likes how good that sounds. He then turns into his middle-aged self, joy pills resting in the palm of his hand. He still feels lost, but this time, he's given up and can't help but to indulge in his destructive habit. His next address to Buddy displays that funny quirk Dusty mentioned, ordering Buddy to call him by his name. The pills then leave his hand and his disappointed scowl is replaced with a cheerful smile as makeup is plastered on his face. Happiness and purpose now fill Brad as he dotes upon his daughter with love and devotion and he turns into the very thing he despised being called. His happiness doesn't last, however, as he scolds Buddy for simply being curious about a boy named Dusty that her uncles mentioned. Brad affirms he never had a son. He then morphs into who he was at the end of his life, after he failed Buddy. Nobody. The disappointment he feels in himself aches his heart, making him wail aloud, tears flowing down his face. 
He begins beating himself, the only appropriate punishment he can inflict, and the heart-rending display fills Buddy with pity. This encounter with Brad is an intense hallucination driven by the joy Buddy has taken. The complex relationship she shared with her father is on full display, with its ups and its downs. It's one that could be filled with happiness and contentment, while at other times, disappointment and dissatisfaction. Brad could be an abusive drug addict who could get his act together and be the best father in the world. Or he could be a doting dad whose mood could flip if simply asked the wrong question. He was a broken man, struggling to cope with the demons of his past while trying to be a parent to an inquisitive child in a twisted, perverted world. And like any parent, he tried desperately to protect her from it. The trauma of his past causing him to hold on to Buddy tightly, too tight. And in the end, he only ended up hurting her. There's one final thing he has to do, the scariest thing for any parent to do. He has to let go, to let Buddy live her own life, make mistakes, learn, and become who she wants to be. This moment has finally come and he has some parting words for his daughter. You have to know this, buddy. I was completely lost before I found you. <laughs> you made me feel something again. Things no one has ever made me feel. You showed me what love really is. <laughs> and that's why, when I look into your eyes, it's the scariest feeling in the world. That's why I buried myself so deep in the darkness. But I promise you, I, I tried so hard to fight it. I tried. And no matter what, I did love you with all my heart. I'm so sorry I failed you, buddy. I miss you so much. Together, in the sea of blood and flowers, Brad and Buddy share one final goodbye. And Brad vanishes, while Buddy, as a free, independent woman, is taken back to the real world. She stands before a bloodied Yado, his throne a gory mess behind him. Yado, his world shattered, flees in disbelief from the imposing buddy, who picks up a small pink pill he dropped, the vaccine to the joy drug. She chases after the scientist, who finds himself at the edge of a pit, caught between a rock and a hard place. Buddy demands answers from him, but when Yado tries to withhold information from her, she menacingly threatens him, pushing him to the edge of the pit. With all he's worked for crumbling around him, the megalomaniac begins arrogantly spouting about himself, about his world, and how Buddy is just a pawn, an insect created by him. He is her father, and she needs to obey him. Buddy turns to see Buzzo, who survived his fight with Sweetheart, but not unscathed. Buddy tells him she didn't need his help, which Buzzo acknowledges, admitting he just didn't want her to listen to Yado anymore. A question is burning in Buddy's mind, and thinking he may know the answer, she asks Buzzo if Yado was really her father. Uncharacteristically, Buzzo gives her an answer. Yado was just a crazy old man. Brad was her father through and through. She was the only one that gave him purpose something not even Dusty could do. Brad loved Buddy with all his heart. Buzzo tells Buddy that he believed Brad was a good person, explaining that what's happened to her wasn't his fault. It was the joy. It was him. They were the things that drove Brad insane. And it was hers, a nameless girl whom he loved, one that twisted him up so much inside. Buzzo goes on to explain that after her death, he had to blame anyone but himself. So he chose to blame Brad, expressing regret in doing so, realizing how many people it affected. He chuckles at the twisted irony he's found himself in. That he was supposed to be her light, but all that's happened is she's pulled him into darkness. Buddy wonders about Buzzo's newfound willingness to satisfy her curiosity. And Buzzo can only reply that it's because she reminds him of the unnamed her. He asks Buddy if she got the vaccine, who confirms she did. 
Buzzo pushes her to take it, to save herself, as it's too late for... Lisa! I did it! I'm a good boy! I swear! Good! Good! Please! Having been a user of joy himself, Buzzo becomes a joy mutant and attacks Buddy. She ferociously defends herself as Buzzo's mutation continues. All the while, he continues his insane rant. The mutations are too much for him, and out of control, he starts eating himself eventually severing his head from his body, freeing him from the pain he's held in his heart for so long. Buddy, covered in blood, backs away from the headless body. She takes a moment and realizes she's completed her task. She's the only one left and is now the ruler, no, the queen of Olaith. She feels another joy trip coming on and tries to talk herself down. And that's when she hears a familiar voice call to her from behind. She walks forward and is astonished to see her brother Dusty standing there in his robe. There's a slight moan and she turns again to see Brad in his mutated form lying closely by her. This doesn't make sense. Buddy freed herself of him. He shouldn't be here. Emotions well up inside her and she crouches down, sobbing. Brad crawls up to her and whispers something in her ear. Something that Buddy says she can't do. Dusty then chimes in and tells her everything she's always wanted to hear. That she was right. That she didn't need them. That they held her back. She completed all of this on her own, with her strength, her intelligence. And now, she's free. She's their queen. No, their god. One that is loved and worshipped and will be forever. He begs her to stay with them, but Buddy knows this is too good to be true. Dusty can't be alive. She's the one that killed him, and the way he's talking, it's not soft. It's powerful. He hasn't stuttered once, and the things he's saying, it's like he's voicing aloud Buddy's innermost desires. That's it. Buddy realizes this is just a joy hallucination, the one she just tried to fight off trying to convince her to give in to the drug's influence. In this moment of clarity, Buddy has a decision to make. She can either give in to the drug and join Rando and Brad in her joyful mind, or take Yato's vaccine and leave them behind. If Buddy chooses to take the vaccine, to face the cruelty of the world and the pain of her life and its stark reality, she gives humanity a chance to continue. The game fast forwards to some time later, fading in to Buddy's saber, now stuck in the ground, signifying she's come to the end of her fight. The camera passes the grave of Buzzo, decorated with a white flower, and comes upon the new Armstrong family, an older Buddy cradling the horn that was used by Dr. Yato, the mutated Brad, clean of blood but bearing the scars of his past, and a small baby with whom the fate of humanity now lies. Nearby lies the grave of a brother and a son whose vision of peace has finally come to pass. If she chooses to forsake the vaccine, to numb the pain of the world, and join Dusty and Brad in her joyful mind, she suffers the same fate as all of those that tread the same path. The game fast forwards to some time later, passing the decimated body of the mutated Brad, coming to the large mutated buddy who has hauled up the corpse of Dusty so he can placate her with his soothing words, watching the pink sunset signal the end of the day and the end of humanity. But if Buddy killed her brother earlier by dropping him into the pit, she'll instead be staring at something else, a small baby she holds in her hand, giving the possibility that humanity isn't as doomed as it seems. And that ends the story of Buddy in Lisa the Joyful. But the game still has a little bit more to offer. There are three scenes that can play after Buddy's decision that give more background to the story. The first is titled Yado, and follows an argument the scientist has with an unnamed person. As the argument unfolds, it becomes apparent it's about Nancy, 
the daughter he mentioned earlier, and Yato's wife, Nancy's mother. Yato reveals pieces of his plan to her, including the eventual fate he has planned for their daughter. After she expresses her disgust in him, Yato reveals she was merely a means to an end, and having no more use for her, kills her by gunning her down and leaving her body to rot. This is who Brad finds in the back of the Joy Lab, along with the note Yada left by her corpse defending his actions. The other two endings are unlocked after meeting certain criteria. Buddy must find a special Joy Mask, hidden in an innocuous shack sitting on the edge of a cliff. After completing the list, if she, while wearing the mask, visits the body of her brother, she will see a hallucination of Brad mourning his son. When she approaches, he vanishes. This unlocks the father ending, which is a flashback to Brad's childhood. Brad has just told his father that he wants to learn how to fight, but Marty refuses to let him learn the Armstrong style from his grandfather because he finds it worthless. He offers Brad something, but when he hesitantly refuses it, Marty beats him to make him comply. The familiar clink of a bottle is heard, and Marty presses him to finish the drink actually praising him when doing so. As a way to celebrate his achievement, Marty says they're going to go visit his sister. This conversation shows Brad was aware of the abuse his sister suffered, and is a dark implication that he may have taken part in it. The final ending requires Buddy to jump off of a cliff to the west of the only village in the game to end up on a cliffside, where she finds a joy lab which she can only enter if wearing the joy mask. She comes to a room that is littered with empty alcohol bottles and joy pills, and at its end is a coffin bordered by white flowers. There's a note on the ground before it with the following message. I'm sorry. I can't do it anymore. I'll always love you. Buzzo. This room was a shrine Buzzo constructed for his love, a place he wallowed in a drug-induced haze until he couldn't anymore until something pushed him to pursue a feeling that was welling up within him. When Buddy leaves, the screen goes black, and we get a taste of the hallucinations Buzzo suffered while under Joy's influence. He wanders a dark cliffside, eventually coming upon Lisa, who pulls him to come play with her, then vanishes. He runs into her several more times, her words devolving into abusive manipulation to get Buzzo to do what she wants to pursue the intense desire within him. He eventually comes upon a bloodied Lisa, who tells him, make him suffer. Behind her lies a mutated Brad, the fruit of the labor Buzzo has been working towards for years. The man he blames for Lisa's death has finally been punished for what he did to her. He's lost his body, his family, and even his mind. And yet, even after achieving the thing he believed would satisfy him, the hurt in Buzzo's heart still resides inside him, and he falls to his knees, a frown on his face, defeated. And at that moment, he hears a voice in the darkness, one that gives him a chance to set him free. That chance is Buddy. By helping her survive all she's been through and giving her a chance at a life, Buzzo can absolve himself of his sins and finally be free of the darkness that rages within him, doing so in the game's finale. This unlocks the Lisa ending, which details the conversation between Lisa and Buzzo in their childhood. He's brought the thing Lisa asked for, and she orders him to use it to cut off the paw of an animal they've captured. Buzzo resists, not having the stomach to continue torturing the poor creature. Lisa asks if he likes her, if he loves her, and when Buzzo affirms he does, she tells him she'll love him back if he just does this. Buzzo, wanting his feeling reciprocated, starts up the buzzsaw and slices off the paw of the animal to Lisa's pleasure. She remarks that she thinks he's ready, and Buzzo wonders what that means. Lisa then orders Buzzo to turn the saw on her and cut her. Buzzo obviously resists. So Lisa pulls at Buzzo's heartstrings, intending to manipulate him the same way she just did. But when that fails, she reveals the real reason she wants him to cut her. She believes that if she's physically mutilated, he won't want her anymore, and will finally leave her alone. 
She begs him to save her, that he's the only one that can. So Buzzo starts up the saw and cuts the young woman whom he loves. Unfortunately for them, it doesn't save Lisa. And shortly after, she takes matters into her own hands and ends the torment she's endured her whole life. These three scenes offer more insight to the characters, giving more context to their lives and their pain, and helps explain how everything ended up the way it did in the conclusion of Lisa the Joyful. And that finally ends the story of the Lisa series. Again, you should take the time to play these games, as my explanations just can't replicate the feelings that emerge from actually experiencing everything the games have to offer, especially in the ending of The Joyful. But if you've watched this all the way through, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the videos, and I hope I was able to do the series justice. If you have any questions, comments, or criticism, please feel free to share. I'd be happy to hear from you. But that's it, so thank you for watching, and see you later.